Well, welcome to Worship with the Presbyterian Community here in Newcastle County Down. Wherever you are tuning in to us this morning, you're more than welcome, and we hope that you'll enjoy and appreciate worshiping God with us today. Psalm 149 says, Let Israel rejoice in their Maker. Let the people of Zion be glad in their King. For the Lord takes delight in his people. He crowns the humble with salvation. We're thinking on this Palm Sunday of what kind of king is Jesus. As we will be led in worship by some of our worship folk, we come to two songs, Good and Gracious King, in which we approach God as a king who nevertheless accepts us and loves us as his children. And in the other song, You Give Your Life Away, we sing of a king who gave his all for us on the cross and took away both our sins and the debt we owe to God for all of them. So let us worship God together.
Let's just pray together, please. Jesus, Lord of the journey, we thank you that you set your face firmly towards Jerusalem with focus and determination and intention, knowing what lay ahead but never turning aside. And in our journey, Jesus, help us to have that focus and determination and intention. Jesus, Lord of the palms, we thank you that you enjoyed the hallelujahs of ordinary people living fully in that moment of delight and accepting their praise. Would you accept our hallelujahs this morning? Would you accept our broken praise as we sing to you now. Jesus, Lord of the cross, we thank you that you went into the heart of our evil and pain, along a way that was both terrible and wonderful, as your kingship became your brokenness and your dying became love's triumph. You have shown us the way of humble service the way of true greatness. Lord Jesus, help us to follow. Amen.
Well, let's pray together. Lord, in this Palm Sunday, we come before you to worship you, not just as a king, but the King of kings and Lord of lords. You are almighty and without beginning or end. Your holy and pure love in your actual being, and you are a God of revelation. You have revealed yourself in the wonders of creation, in the scriptures, and above all in the person and work of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. We praise you that you are our creator, that you have made us human beings different and distinct from the other creatures in the world because you have made us in your image. And we have listened to the psalmist who told us, the Lord takes delight in his people. Lord, we ask, how can you delight in us? For we recognize that we are sinful. Too often we give in to selfishness and greed. Too often we run people down and disrespect others who are different from ourselves. Too often we treat others in ways we would hate to be treated ourselves. Too often we fail to stand for truth and righteousness and we give in to cynicism and rather than bringing light and hope to our world, we appear negative and lacking in a positive contribution to society. Lord, forgive us, we pray. But we thank you this morning that you do take delight in us, that you have not finished with us, that we are works in progress. We pray that your Holy Spirit would shape our lives more and more into the likeness of Jesus Christ, our King. Help us like him to be holy, fill with the light of your truth, full of grace and mercy, that we who are the undeserved recipients of all these things may treat others with the same love and grace of Jesus. Lord, as we worship you today, help us to hear your word and to respond to it by determining to make you King and Lord of our whole lives. These things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son and our Saviour. Amen. And now let's hear from Lois Gibson, our youth worker. Good morning, everyone. I hope that you're all doing well. I hope that you all had a great week back at school this week. Now, this morning, you may notice I am somewhere a little bit different. I am outside again today. But this morning, I want to challenge you to think of a few words, okay? I want to say one word, and what you have to do at home is take a wee second to think of things that match up with this word, or what are some of the things that come into your mind whenever you hear this word. So the word that I want you to think about today is king. What comes to your mind or what do you think of whenever I say the word king? Maybe it is queen or maybe it is crown. Ruler, not the measuring tape, but someone who rules. Uh, a throne. Or what about castle? Those may be the same words that you thought of, but I wonder, did any of you think of Jesus? Did you think of Jesus whenever I said the word king? Well, today is Palm Sunday, and I just want us to take a wee moment to think back to that first Palm Sunday. The day when Jesus the King, Jesus the Messiah, and Jesus the Saviour comes into Jerusalem. Um, not in a horse-drawn carriage, not in a fancy car but on a donkey and people were standing and lining the streets and waving palm branches because this was a sign of victory and triumph. Huge crowds laying their cloaks on the ground as Jesus goes past and as he rode through the streets of Jerusalem people were shouting blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. It was all very exciting and people were so excited to see Jesus. And as exciting as this all was, the people there really didn't know who Jesus was. They thought he was going to set up an earthly kingdom and that he would do great things for them here on earth, which he did, but they didn't understand that his kingdom was in heaven. And in just a few days, these same people that were shouting Hosanna and lining the streets and cheering him on would be shouting crucify him because he wasn't the kind of king that they wanted. The good news for us is today that Jesus is still king. He is king of kings, lord of lords, 
And for us today, it is important that we take some time to celebrate Jesus the King. And as we go into this week, we're celebrating what Jesus did for us on the cross as King, a King who's waiting for us in heaven. So let's pray. Dear God, we celebrate today just as those people celebrated in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. This is the day that you have made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. And we are just so thankful that you sent Jesus for us. We thank you for Jesus, our King. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks very much, Lois. She's great, isn't she? Uh, well, I want to, at this stage, make a, a number of announcements that uh, uh, our Minister Andrew Borland has asked me to uh, make and first of all to say uh, this incoming week is Holy Week as you know and we will be marking Good Friday with a special online service and that will be posted on our YouTube channel and Facebook page at 7 p.m. So 7 p.m. Good Friday put it in your diary and do join us for that short time of reflection and praise. Then, as announced last week, we're delighted to say that along with other churches in Northern Ireland, we'll be able to reopen our doors and gather again with our first services physically together in the building planned for Easter Sunday, the 4th of April. With social distancing measures, our seating capacity is somewhat restricted, and to accommodate more people, we'll therefore be running two sittings or two services on Sundays at 930 at 11.15 a.m. The building and seating will be thoroughly cleaned and disinfected between services. So the Easter Sunday service at both sittings that day will be an all-age church family service. Uh, we're very excited at the prospect of being able to meet together in person to rejoice together in celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. In meeting together again, we want to assure you that we'll be taking all necessary steps and precautions to ensure that we have a COVID secure environment. We're now going to watch a short instructional video about what to expect when you come along uh, to our services. Many will have seen these before, but please give renewed attention to it as it gives a helpful reminder of the procedures that we have in place. Let's watch the video. Hello everyone, we're really looking forward to being able to welcome people back into our buildings as we are able to reopen and gather again. The purpose of this video is to walk you through the building and to talk you through what to expect when you do come along to one of our gatherings. Of course, our priority is safety, particularly with respect to the restrictions around COVID-19. Obviously, if you do have any of the symptoms of COVID-19, a high temperature, a new continuous cough, or a loss or change to your sense of smell or taste, if you should be self-isolating, or if you have been in close contact with a confirmed case, then you should not attend. Also, uh, do exercise wisdom if you think you might be vulnerable because of age or other health conditions. Now, because of social distancing, we are limited in terms of the numbers that we can accommodate in the building. Uh, and so to come along, you will need to book in advance, either online or by contacting the church office. We will post the details of how you can do so on our Facebook page. On the day of the gathering, please do plan to arrive early from 15 minutes or so before the service time so we can get people seated as efficiently as possible. We have had to put a one-way system in place at the church, so you will enter from the back door here on Valencia Place. Should you have to wait outside, please do maintain social distancing. Also, unless you have a medical reason not to, then you should wear a face mask or covering in line with the church leaders and government's guidance. On entry through the door, you will be greeted by a steward. Please refrain from handshakes, hugs or physical contact throughout the time in the building. There will be a hand sanitising station on entry. Please do make use of it. Proceed down through the corridor and welcome area in the direction marked out on the floor. There will also be floor markings to help you maintain social distancing throughout the building. Also, please do not wander off into other parts of the building. The upstairs, for example, remains closed at this time. As you pass through the welcome area, there will be a basket in which to drop your offering. Although we would encourage, if possible, uh, to give by online means or through standing order.
When you reach the glass door, please wait here for a steward who will direct you to where to sit. You will find the main auditorium looks a bit different. Some pews are blocked off to maintain social distancing and the stewards will also be directing you to follow a one-way system. Please understand you may have a favourite seat in normal times, but at the moment you cannot sit just anywhere of your choosing. You must sit where you are directed to sit by a steward. Once you're in your seat, please remain here for the duration of the service. We'd love to see families coming along, kids included, but please be mindful that you will have to stay together in the seating assigned to you throughout the service. All the books have been removed from the pews to facilitate cleaning. You might want to bring along your own Bible so that you can follow along in the service. In the event of a fire or other emergency, there will be stewards on the doors and they will direct you what to do. We would encourage you to use toileting facilities at home before arriving at church. Although the toilets in the welcome area will be available, it would be helpful if we could minimise their use as much as possible. The service will last about 45 minutes. At the end, please remain in your seats until you are directed to leave by a steward. Everyone will exit the building through the side door beside the pulpit straight out onto the street. Unfortunately, people cannot remain around in the building to converse. We hope that you might find appropriate and restriction compliant ways of speaking to others once outside the building. Well everyone, I hope this walkthrough has been helpful. Uh, please do bear with us in the weeks ahead as we learn uh, from our early experiences and see how this goes and think about what will serve the welfare of all people uh, as we go forward. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25 uh, says, uh, Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another. Uh, I do hope that those of us who know and love the Lord Jesus will make a priority of gathering together uh, as Christian believers in this place once again. We do look forward to welcoming you in the Sundays ahead. Now, booking is already open for Easter Sunday. In the days ahead, we'll get subsequent Sundays lined up for booking as well. So please book for the Sunday services week by week by 5 p.m. on the Friday for services on the Sunday immediately following it. In other words, for Easter Sunday, for example, please book by 5 p.m. on Good Friday. You can book online via the website Eventbrite. Uh, the link to that will be on our Facebook page. Or alternatively, you can telephone the church office. If there's no answer, do leave a voicemail message and Pamela will get back to you. It would be wonderful to see our church family returning and coming together to our services. If we find ourselves booked out for both sittings regularly in the weeks immediately ahead, we'll consider how to expand capacity, perhaps by adding further sittings of the service. Audio recordings of the sermon will be posted online each Sunday and audio and CD recordings of the whole service can be made available to anyone. Just contact the office to request that. We do look forward to seeing you very soon. Now this Sunday evening, uh, tonight, if you're watching this on Sunday morning, uh, we have our usual hangout uh, on Zoom at 6.15, followed by prayer time at 6.30 p.m. As we come to prayers of intercession this morning, the moderator of the Presbyterian Church, Dr. David Bruce, has uh, handed out a statement that uh, he's asking would be read in our churches. So if you would bear with me, I want to read this and then make it part of our prayer of intercession. The Presbyterian Church in Ireland has called on the Secretary of State to step back from undermining Northern Ireland's devolved institutions with new sweeping powers that ride roughshod over local decision-making. Presbyterian moderator, the Right Reverend Dr. David Bruce, described the regulations as ill-considered and irresponsible, and says that they should be withdrawn by the Secretary of State. In his statement, Dr. Bruce said, as a church with a strong pro-life position, we have put on record our total opposition to the imposition of abortion laws in Northern Ireland. 
Such laws have removed protection from the lives of unborn children. On Friday, we spoke of our grave concern at news the Secretary of State was seeking powers to implement those laws over and above the heads of locally elected representatives by directing Northern Ireland's Department of Health. These radical and unreasonably sweeping powers go much further than we had been led to believe uh, would be the case. Dr. Bruce continued, far from working hard to encourage the building of consensus around highly contentious issues, the regulations laid before Parliament today drive a coach and horses through Northern Ireland's hard-won and finely balanced devolved constitutional settlement. These powers not only devalue Northern Ireland's purposely unique system of negotiated government, they also give the Secretary of State the freedom to interfere directly and at will with every single department of devolved government in Northern Ireland. For instance, the Secretary of State is seeking to be able to unilaterally direct what would happen in Northern Ireland schools, taking local power and decision-making away from governors, teachers and parents on sensitive issues, therefore undermining the right of schools to embrace a particular ethos. The moderator concluded by saying, the Secretary of State and those supportive of devolution cannot claim to be upholding Northern Ireland's fragile devolved settlement while at the same time pursuing such an ill-considered and irresponsible intervention which undermines that very system. The Presbyterian Church in Ireland has always been supportive of devolution, has encouraged it and prayed for it. These radical sweeping powers that ride roughshod over our local decision-making on such sensitive areas are simply unacceptable. The Secretary of State should withdraw the regulations and if not, Members of Parliament should refuse to grant him the powers that he seeks. End of that statement from our moderator. I wonder, can we take this opportunity to join together in prayer? And we will pick up on that statement in our prayer. Let us pray. Lord God, we pray for Northern Ireland this morning with all its tensions and difficulties. We think of the proposed powers the Secretary of State is assuming in a few days that will have to be debated in both Houses of Parliament within four weeks. Lord, these powers relate not only to the emotive issues around abortion, but to a much wider remit. We pray that, if possible, Westminster would not agree to these proposals. Lord, you have heard the cry of our Presbyterian Church on all this, and I know if I'm honest, I find it hard to lead our people in prayer on all of this at such a time with so many sensitivities. But we bring this issue before you, Lord, asking that what is right and just for our situation may come to pass. We pray for our assembly at Stormont. We confess we find it easy to criticize our politicians, and we confess that we all know what is wrong, but find it hard to agree on the solutions that should be put in place. And that is true whether it be about abortion or the border in the Irish Sea or other issues. So we pray this morning for Arlene Foster, the First Minister, and for Michelle O'Neill, the Deputy First Minister, for Robin Swan, our Health Minister, and all who have responsibility in this place. Help them to know how best to respond to the imposition of laws from Westminster especially in those things that go against community consensus. Help all our politicians to find wisdom and understanding. Enable them to work together for the good of everyone in our society and protect us as we seek, no matter what the difficulties, to make devolved government work and work well. Lord, you have told us to work for the flourishing of society and thus of every human being, regardless of class, creed or ethnicity. We pray your blessing on organizations such as Both Lives Matter, Care, Life, and all who seek a better way that we might choose life and to care with compassion and grace for those who are in crisis. We pray for laws that would affirm life and that you would help us to value every human being as those created by you in your divine image. Heavenly Father, as we look at our broken world, we see many wars, refugees, hunger, and whole nations devastated by the coronavirus pandemic. We pray for healing for our world, 
for success in the efforts to vaccinate the world. And we pray for hope over coronavirus. Lord, help your people to be your voice, hands and feet to a world in need at this time. We thank you, Lord, for the NHS, and we pray, given the extreme pressures of the last year, that you'd give all who work in it resilience, help them to keep on going on, and grant that they may continue to cope with whatever lies before us. Help them to know that they're valued, and help us to show our appreciation in words and actions. Finally, this morning, we pray for all we know who are sick, those who have been bereaved, those who are struggling with issues around mental health, those who are carers, those who are vulnerable, those who have lost jobs or have had businesses devastated by enforced closure, and those in any other kind of need. Lord, bring your healing, peace, and hope, we pray. Hear us in Jesus' name. Amen. And in our reading this morning, we turn to Luke's Gospel, chapter 19, verses 28 to 40, and it is the story of the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. So let us hear God's word together. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany on the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Tell them the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Amen. God bless us in that reading of his word. Let's join together in prayer. Lord, we've heard lots of words this morning already, but now as we turn to your word, I pray that you would help us to hear and to respond to it. In Jesus' name, amen. Follow any of the four gospels through and you can't help but notice how Jesus deliberately set his face towards going to Jerusalem on what we now call the first Palm Sunday. And he knew that this would trigger events that would lead to his crucifixion. Jesus had on more than one occasion warned his disciples of his impending death. And as we approach Easter, it's important that we remember the circumstances and events did not overtake Jesus. Rather, he deliberately chose every action and was very aware of the consequences that would follow. Consider these things. By means of his entry into Jerusalem, Jesus deliberately provoked a popular demonstration. He was very aware that he was extraordinarily popular with ordinary people, but increasingly looked upon with antagonism by the religious leaders whom he knew were plotting to kill him. He knew that a show of enthusiasm from the masses would antagonize his enemies. Indeed, look at Luke look at 19, verse 38. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. It's very interesting. This is taken from Psalm 118, but in the psalm it's blessed is he, and now the people in, uh, substitute for he, king. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And that would have, for Jews who knew their scriptures, linked in with Zechariah 9, verses 9 and 10. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. 
Through the religious leaders, therefore, Jesus was allowing people to associate him with God's Messiah. Hence their response and the reply of Jesus in Luke 19, 39 and 40. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the very stones will cry out. In other words, Jesus is saying, I am in fact the true king they are welcoming. And to silence them would mean the cobblestone streets would cry out to me. Little wonder that infuriated the Pharisees. Before Pam Sunday, Jesus had been very careful not to overtly antagonize the authorities. There had been attempts and plots to kill him. For example, having annoyed people in the synagogue, we read in Luke 4, 29 and 30, they got up and drove him out of the town. They took him to the brow of a hill on which the town was built in order to throw him down the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Or after another healing on the Sabbath, we read in Matthew 12 and 14, but the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. So this volatility and extreme reaction to his teaching and his miracles and works is why sometimes Jesus told people he had healed not to say to anybody what had been done for them. But now he knew his time had come. And the whole thrust of his ministry had been for ages a process of going to Jerusalem to offer up his life. Very clearly, Jesus was taking charge of events and would remain in control until deliberately he gave up his life on the cross. The triumphal entry of Jesus in Jerusalem also clearly picked up on messianic prophecies and expectations. When the people hailed Jesus as the son of David, this was another term for Messiah, which is what annoyed the disciples, and their anger was fueled when Jesus said if he told the cheering crowd to keep quiet, the very stones would cry out. Here the Lord of creation was deliberately setting his face towards the most unimaginably difficult, incredibly painful part of his life. But he willingly took on the task of giving up his life out of love for each one of us. But to the Pharisees, his reply was seen as a blasphemous statement. And as we know, it soon led to his death. So one of the questions I think that we uh, may learn from Pam Sunday is what kind of king is Jesus? Verse 36, as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. The spreading of garments indicated homage being paid to a person of high rank. A similar thing happened when Jehu was anointed king of Israel. So we read in 2 Kings 9, 13, that the people, quote, hurried and took their cloaks and spread them under him on the bare steps. I referred earlier to the fact that in quoting Psalm 118, verse 38, the people substituted the word king for the word he in the psalm. And in every way, the people were welcoming Jesus as a king, but as one they thought would lead to political power or temporal power. Surely they thought this miracle-working, authoritative teacher and prophet would be the one who would lead Israel to a new political golden age. But Jesus was not interested in stoking the fires of Jewish nationalism nor was he prepared to overthrow Rome. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, he said, and to God what is God's. That was his teaching. And in our context, Jesus is not a king to be manipulated in the causes that we fight. The slogans for God and Ulster are God and Ireland are not what his kingship and kingdom is about. He is neither Republican nor Unionist. He's neither pro-Brexit nor pro-Europe. He isn't for our American friends a Democrat or Republican. Rather, Jesus calls us to a higher throne and a higher authority than any human cause. Nor is Jesus a kind of magic talisman to be looked at uh, or to for difficult times. You know the temptation that we all have to make bargains with God. A young person going into an exam and might say, Lord, if you help me pass this exam, I'll go to church twice on Sunday for a year. Or, or maybe you'll say, Lord, if you'd help me wipe out my debts, uh, I'll teach in Sunday school. 
Or maybe in this pandemic, we're saying, Lord, if you help me to get through without taking sick, I'll read the Bible more regularly. But God doesn't do bargains like that. That's not the kind of king Jesus is. Of course, Jesus is with us in times of crisis. Of course, he is concerned for us when we're under pressure, when we feel weak or vulnerable. And of course, we should pray about the difficulties and uh, problems that we face. But Jesus is not interested in being a good luck talisman for us. He's not a kind of Christian version of a lucky rabbit's foot. He's not interested in only being king for a day or in days of trouble. What he wants is to reside in the throne of our whole lives. He wants to rule over every day and every facet of our lives, not just in a time of difficulty. So I want us to think a little bit more of the kind of king uh, that Jesus is. And another three things, hopefully quite briefly. First of all, he is a relational king, verses 30 and 31. Go ahead to the village ahead of you as you enter it. You'll find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why you're untying it, tell him the Lord needs it. Now, I've never met royalty, although I almost did. Barbara and I were once uh, privileged to be invited to a garden party in Hillsborough Castle with the late Queen Mother. We went on a day that was very windy and all the people who had bought big hats or uh, hired them or whatever uh, couldn't even wear them, it was so windy. Uh, and the Queen Mother was certainly there, but she was in a kind of marquee and I think the closest we got to her was about 20 feet away. So we never actually met her. Then some years later, we were on holiday in the north of Scotland and we went to the Queen Mother's uh, Scottish home in the castle of May. And there we saw many of her personal effects. One of the things that she apparently collected, and we saw lots of them, were little uh, soft toy versions of the Loch Ness monster, Nessie. Uh, and she had them dotted all over the place, uh, uh, above doors and all kinds of strange places. So we were able to see the Queen Mother. We were able to see her home and see personal effects uh, and things that she had but we didn't actually ever get to meet her or know her. And I think it's the same with Jesus. He is a relational king. And either we can be in position of knowing a lot about him, but not knowing him, or we can be in position of meeting his love with ours and coming to know him. And I think when it comes to sending disciples to get this donkey, I think the owners of the donkey must have known Jesus, and hence the key for them was when they said, the Lord has need of it, they immediately released it to Jesus, whom obviously they knew. And so we have a relational God. He is an incarnational God. He is one who loves us and wants to journey with us through life. Though he is a king and God and Lord of creation, holy, eternal, and all-powerful, yet he's capable of being known and loved. And thus he wants nothing more than relationship with all of us whom he has made in his image. You know, Christianity is never about religion. There's too much religion in the world, and it's mostly a negative thing. The king wants us to know him and to love him in a two-way relationship as we meet his love with our own. He is not a king in a remote palace, uh, aloof from his people, distant from his people, but one who is able to be known and one who knows us and loves us and wants his love to be met with our own. So he is a relational king. Secondly, he's a king to be obeyed. Luke 19, 32 says, those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. Their obedience to his instructions was rewarded with finding the animal that Jesus was looking for. But I think there's two aspects of obedience here that uh, occur to me this morning. Firstly, there's the necessity of being obedient to the commands of Jesus in the way that the two disciples uh, were obedient, going off and seeking out the donkey that Jesus was to ride on. I think we need to be vigilant against a pick-and-mix faith that says, we only obey Jesus when it's convenient. And so when we think no one is looking, we compromise on the truth and we do what we feel like, no matter what God's word says. 
You know, Jesus made it very simple at one level. He said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. That's simple. And yet, what when you're faced with a particular situation? For example, you might get away without paying tax on some income. To obey Jesus is to be honest with the inland revenue. Or say your reading of Scripture leads you to believe that all sexual intercourse outside of marriage uh, between a man and a woman is sinful. But you argue to yourself, surely that's anachronistic. If two people love each other and aren't doing any harm to themselves or anybody else and it feels right, even if the Bible forbids it, what's the harm? Well, to be obedient to the Lord as King of Kings is to ensure that we treat marriage, for example, as a union between a man and a woman marked by faithfulness and unswerving commitment. Or maybe you find yourself getting richer and really enjoying the trappings that money and success bring. Who wouldn't? But your family is being neglected because you live to work rather than living or working to live. And the Lord says, you shall have no other gods before me. So what do you do? You know you need to do something radical in order to maintain family life and connection. Obedience to God's commands is not for our convenience, but for the glory and honor of God. And actually, obedience to God isn't restrictive. It liberates us to become our best selves. It gives us a a framework for living that is good and honest and true. Be obedient. But there's a second aspect uh, of obedience. Quite often Jesus asks his disciples to do strange things. Maybe go find an animal for me to ride on wasn't so strange. But think of other things that he said. See what packed lunches are available to feed the thousands. Or put your nets out on the other side of the boat when the experts had fished all night and caught nothing. Sometimes Jesus asks us to go out on a limb, put up a new building, ask for more money in the middle of a pandemic, give practical care to those affected by current circumstances, send out more missionaries and pay for them, be sacrificial, learn to live more simply, reach a lost world with the good news, pray for Muslims to turn to Jesus, ask your Roman Catholic neighbor to church, Whatever God asks you and I to do, even if it seems beyond us, when we're convinced God wants us to act, will we do so in obedience? And finally, Jesus is to be worshipped properly. Luke 19 and 38, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Although the people on the first Pan Sunday used Scripture to welcome Jesus, they were worshipping a king they wanted on their own terms. How else can you explain that within days, shouts of Hosanna or save us, we pray, turn to shouts, crucify him, crucify him. You see, Jesus has the right to our exclusive loyalty. He is to be a king in our lives, not to be manipulated by us into the kind of king that we want, but he is to be a king who demands exclusive loyalty above our jobs, our families, our societies, our movements that we belong to, even above that of the church. He is either first in our lives or he is not. He cannot abide half-hearted, weak loyalty. Remember what Jesus said in the words to one of the churches in Revelation 3, uh, verses 15 and 16. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my light, mouth. Strong words. But if Jesus is truly to be worshipped, we are to love and serve him with wholehearted devotion, giving him 100% of our lives and holding nothing back. And we are to worship him, in fact, not just with the songs that we sing on a Sunday or the time that we spend in church, but we are to worship him with our whole lives, living for him day after day. So to welcome the King of Kings is to welcome him then as King or Lord in all of our lives, is to have a relationship with him, is to be obedient to him, and to worship him exclusively above 
and beyond all others. I wonder how you and I are doing on those four counts this morning. Let us pray. Lord, on this Pam Sunday, help us to acknowledge you as King and Lord of all of our lives. Thank you that you came and died on the cross and rose again that we might have a relationship with you. And Father, I pray that if there are those of us listening this morning who don't have a relationship with Jesus, may we ask you, Lord, to come into our lives and that by your Holy Spirit you would become real to us and come to dwell in us. Help us, Lord, to be obedient to you and to worship you above and beyond all others and all other things. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our final song, and uh, before we uh, introduce that, a word of thanks to those who have provided all the aspects of our service today. But our final song, King of Kings, uh, enables us to respond to the one who accepts us and gives us what we do not deserve, salvation and a future in heaven with the King of Kings who provides us with royal robes we don't deserve. Let us worship God in the song, King of Kings. May the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you all and all whom you love. Amen.